What is truth? What is faith? What is doubt? What is? Today I bring on a professional philosopher, Dr. Travis Dickinson from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary where he teaches apologetics and philosophy. Uh, Dr. Dickinson got his uh, bachelor's uh, in education at uh, Alaska Bible College, and then he later got an MA in Christian apologetics from Biola University, and uh, then went on to get an MA in philosophy uh, of religion there as well, and then got an MA and a PhD in philosophy from Iowa University, the University of Iowa. So my man's been to school, and he's got uh, a lot of uh, philosophical education. He is an epistemologist. That's what he uh, wrote his dissertation on, epistemology, and I'll let him explain to you what that word even means. Uh, but I'm super excited to have him on. I've uh, been trying to have him on for a while now, but uh, uh, things finally clicked and worked out. He also recently had a discussion at the Atheist Christian Book Club that was... Let's just say interesting, and I'll let him explain that as well. You're going to want to hear that story for sure. Uh, if you uh, want to watch the bonus segment, Five More Minutes with Dr. Travis Dickinson, be sure to follow the Patreon link in the description and become a, a su patron supporter at the $5 level. For just a dollar, you can get uh, early release as well as uh, monthly live q and or weekly live Q&A episodes or just however often I'm am going to do those, but I did recently start doing live Q&A episodes, but for patrons only. Again, just a dollar a month, become a patron supporter by following the link in the description. Hope you enjoy the episode, guys. If you do, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, leave us a review. Uh, as always, guys, enjoy. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Help Me Believe, the show about Christian apologetics and theology. My name is Hayden Clark, your host, and I am excited to introduce my special guest to you. His name is Dr. Travis Dickinson. He is a professor of apologetics and philosophy at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. How are you doing today, Dr. Dickinson? Oh, I'm doing amazing. How are you, Hayden? Hey, I'm pretty good. Thanks uh, so much for coming on. I know we've been kind of trying to schedule this and get you to come yeah. on for a, probably since <laughs> I started the podcast. But right. you are a busy man. But it, well, uh, you know, it kind of lined up right when uh, the book came out. I think when did the book come yeah. out? Uh, book came out. I want to say in November. Yeah, so it's probably right around the, the time I started doing the podcast. Yeah. And so we've got, you know, I'm sure you've been very busy with the, you know, doing some book tours and things like that. So. Uh, well, I, I'm excited to uh, have you on. Like I said, um, uh, uh, I know you probably got a busy schedule and all that, so it's uh, it's uh, it means a lot to me that you'd come on. Uh, for those who aren't uh, familiar with who you are, I thought it might be uh, helpful to give a brief introduction. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm. Um, uh, well, how far back you want me to go? <laughs> <laughs> as far as you want, man. Uh, yeah. well, let's do this. What's your testimony, yeah. and uh, yeah. and and go from there. <laughs> yeah. So my testimony uh, for me, I you know I can't not mention that I grew up you know sort of in a Christian, uh, a very Christian environment. So my my folks were in the ministry. Um, went to a Christian school, uh, church on Sunday. So it was kind of like. I didn't even know there were un unbelievers, yeah. I think, for a long time, um, right? But, uh, you know, it all sort of, in a way, came crashing down for me, at least intellectually speaking, in seminary. Mm. <laughs> so when I'm supposed to be training myself yeah. uh, for ministry, uh, I think for me, I, I was sort of in, a, in classrooms where um, we were all, you know, sort of getting the inf Christian information and... Um, you know, being told what we should believe in that sort of thing. And not, and not, I mean, not Biola, which is sort of this, you know, paradigm of, of Christian schools that are taking, uh, you know, the evidence seriously and stuff. But for me, I think I just realized that I wasn't. Um, right. And I was very satisfied with all the Christian answers and wasn't, uh, and I think I just didn't feel like we were holding those um, Christian sort of claims up to the fire the way that we ought to be and sort of taking the challenges uh, as seriously as we could be. And so that actually put me into a pretty serious time of doubt and uh, where I had to really question for myself those things that I, you know, sort of grew up believing. And um, but I, I came through that and I always say, you know, for me, that's sort of uh, uh, what um, becomes in, in a way my primary message is, is that uh, with apologetics is that when we 
sort of press into the doubts, um, we can actually find the truth. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a great sort of tool. It's a great uh, learning experience for us um, to find the truth and find answers and, and sort of have a much better and well-grounded beliefs. Yeah, and well, I'll just say, uh, if it became your message, it was an effective one because I know a young seminarian that was at Southwestern who was having <laughs> doubts himself and came across a fellow named Dr. Travis Dickinson who has a blog called The Benefit of the Doubt, and that helped, helped me tremendously. Awesome. Uh, surprise, I'm the seminarian, by the way. Uh, yeah. And so I actually have a very similar story. I started going to Southwestern online doing the NTS. I was oh, a, a, right. youth, yeah. a youth pastor, and then all of a sudden, I don't know, it just clicked with me that I – I don't have any idea why why I I believe other than an experience I had had, which was very real and um, confirming for me. But other than that, I was like, well, I don't really I couldn't answer the question. Why does God? uh, How do you know God exists? How do you know uh, Jesus rose from the dead? Even a crazier one that or how do you know the Bible is God's word? What does that even mean? Um, so I started having doubts at uh, seminary as well. Like you said, it's kind yeah. of a, a weird concept. But uh, we were talking beforehand about uh, our mutual friend Jay Warner Wallace. When I had him on the podcast for the first time, he explained it pretty well to me. He was saying, you know, when you go to seminary, uh, whereas before you went to seminary, you're reading your Bible and stuff because you just have a, a strong desire to. And now, yeah. you're, now you're reading it because you got a test on Friday. Right. Uh, so there's kind of that that comes into it. And also just the aspect of dissecting everything really makes you yeah. question it. So is that kind of what uh, you experienced as well? Is that pretty good? I think, yeah, I think so. And, and also it was um, reading other perspectives because mm-hmm. I had great professors at Biola that um, – you know, part of the class was to read about folks from other faiths and atheists. And it was sort of like I, I just hadn't had the exposure, even though I would have said I did. I, I think I thought I had. But um, it was it was sort of trying to put myself in the shoes of folks of other faiths and say, you know, if I was Buddhist, if I grew up in a Buddhist household with parents in Buddhist ministry. I don't know if there's really Buddhist ministry, but anyway, uh, right. Would I be myself Buddhist? And so it was kind of like, um, what for me, what I had to ask the question, the difficult question of what makes Christianity stand apart from all the other faiths, including, uh, including atheism, but also including agnosticism. Cause I think mm-hmm. both of those need to get a fair shake as well. And if we're going to come out being believing Christians, we need to, um, you know, at least address that view or, or say why we shouldn't be agnostic on the issues of God and so on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I, you know, you were talking about reading other texts as embar- yeah. as embarrassing or other views, as embarrassing as this is, the text that did it for me that caused me to doubt was the God delusion. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but uh, you know, looking back, I feel so silly because those you know uh, objections aren't the greatest. We won't hammer on Richard Dawkins, but yeah, uh, but those objections do, aren't the they greatest. They do kind of hit hit a certain. Target. If you don't and, know, you know, yeah. if you've literally gone your whole life without hearing an objection to God, which was yeah. me, then you go, oh crap, who did create yeah. God? <laughs> right, and and that's they're they're rhetorically powerful. Oh, he's an excellent once writer. You, once yeah. you dig in, then I think it's you know, and, and especially when you you get a bit more training in philosophy and um, you know apologetics and, and these things, then then you see, yeah, okay, these are not the hardest hitting yeah. <laughs> questions. Uh, yeah, no. Well, let's just go straight in there. What do you think the solution is? Because I know I'm not unique. I mean, first of all, you just had the same experience, but I, I know we're not unique. I know a lot of people. Uh, at some point in their life, hear an objection to God, and just like us, go. I've literally never heard this before. So, yeah. what? Who? Who? Who's? Um, kind of. Who? Who? Who's? Who's? Who has the onus on trying to prevent that from happening? Or I don't want to say who's to blame, but I don't know how else to word that. Uh, who's, okay. Who, who's responsible, and how do we fix it? Yeah, parents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My my parents are to blame. No. Um, I I really do think so. You know, I, I one of the things that I love to blog about and um, talk. I, I talk to my students a lot about um, this idea that we need to be really intentional how we raise our kids. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about that and then sort of expand it out because I think 
sure. many of the same things could be said about the family. I mean, this is kind of always the case. The same things that could be said about the family can be said about the church. Uh, it's different context, but a lot of the same principles apply. Sure. So for me, it's that um, I this this comes as a little bit of shock to people sometimes. Probably not you, but. Um, uh, some of your listeners maybe is I want my kids to doubt their faith mm-hmm. uh, and I want them to do it in my own household. Right. Right. Because I, I would obviously far prefer them to doubt their faith uh, in my household as opposed to say secular campus somewhere far from me with some winsome, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, atheist, uh, you know, professor or whatever. Um, and in other words, I, I, I want, I actually want my kids to feel the struggle of saying, you know, I've never heard that before. That seems like a problem for these beliefs that I have grown up believing and and been hearing from mom and dad and from pastor and youth pastor and children's minister and so on. Um, I want them to feel that tension. Mm -hmm. Um, I also want to be right there to help lead them through that and ask the deep and difficult questions give them how I sort of think about that issue. And of course, this always has to be done on the level of, you know, the, the age appropriate level and, and, and where they're at, for example. Um, but I want them to feel the tension of that. And then I want them to feel the sort of relief that comes as they press in and find answers to these, sure. you know, truly deep and difficult questions, perhaps. Uh, and the reason, it, it, beyond the fact that now they have truth, hopefully, now they have a well-grounded belief that's true or, or likely to be true, uh, but even more than that, the next time in just their own studies or in their own circles or when they maybe are out on a, uh, you know, kind of on their own, and they feel that initial sort of tension, in the hopefully in the back of their mind, they've got this confidence yeah. that... Uh, okay, I know what I got to do. I got to press in, search for truth, and it's going to be okay. Yeah. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to, you know, pop out the other side Christian. I, I think they will because I think Christianity is true, um, right? I think there's really good answers to these sorts of questions. So, of course, I think that, but I'm at least in principle, uh, you know, open to the fact that maybe my kids land on different yeah, answers. That's a good point. And that scares yeah. me to death, yeah. uh, to be honest. But at the same time, um, I, I'm, a, I'm certainly open to them, you know, sort of finding, uh, other Christian views, you know, more plausible or other, you know, I, like that's, that's just something we've got to be okay with. I would far rather them be embracing that lifestyle of pressing into questions and doubts yeah. and being rationally grounded in their beliefs than just simply mindlessly following whatever I say, uh, you know, in a blind kind of way. You know, I think you can make an argument that uh, the last part that you just described there, that that's not even faith anyway. So right. I, I don't think, I don't know, you know, because, uh, and you hinted at this as well, a lot of objections you get to this are, well, what if they walk away? Right. What, well, well, first of all, how do you answer that? Uh, what if they walk away? So I, I have to be open to that because I, I want them to, honestly contend with these questions. I don't want them to just merely take my word for it, but I'm also not of a mind. I mean, there's, there's some people that'll just sort of, uh, this is also how I don't teach philosophy where I just sort of like, um, try to mix the pot so very much that people have no idea which way is up. And yeah. <laughs> right? so yeah. a lot of people have actually lost their faith in a Christian on a Christian campus uh, in philosophy class, like we don't have the best reputation as philosophy professors. So, um, in, in parenting too, I, 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 I would rather my, my kid, uh, honestly pursue the truth. But in order to do that, I've got to be open to the fact that they may walk away. Now, again, that would be crushing to me because I certainly wouldn't want them to reject their faith, but I, 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 more than anything, want them to honestly embrace the faith. Yeah, for sure. You see what I mean? Yeah. Okay, so you go to Biola, you got some doubts, um, you presumably find some answers, and then you go on and uh, you become a PhD in philosophy, correct? Yeah, there's a few steps in between, but well, hit some of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, continue. So yeah, for me, it was uh, when I originally went to Biola, I went for their um, their apologetics program, and it was in in my mind, I, I did it actually their entire program in a year. 
uh, 36 credits uh, or units or whatever. What? Wait, hold year. on. You did 36 hours in a year? Yeah, that's oh right. Oh, my gosh. So I thought I, thought I, was, I was, was a nerd. <laughs> well, I was dating my wife long distance. Okay. So I had a little bit of motivation to kind of get it done and get back. <laughs> um, and we got married after that. So, uh, But in the course of that year, uh, I, it was kind of like I, I knew I was not yet done. There was there was too much. Uh, again, my perspective was I want to get back out to ministry, you know, sort of get in, get out, and just get that slip of paper at the end. And in the course of the year, actually, it was uh, J.P. Moreland, uh, who was a professor of mine, and he challenged us uh, as students uh, that we would uh, value not just the piece of paper, not just the sort of content, but just the whole package that comes with studying and, and uh, embracing the life of the mind, being in seminary, and allowing that to, get, sort of giving it the time to form us in a certain way, um, rather than having this sort of typical seminary yeah. student outlook of just sort of Give me, let me know what I need to know for the test. Yeah, give me the, the credentials. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's kind of what a, a, you know, it's not just seminary, but kind of education in yeah. general. I mean, because I, um, I went to and got a, a business degree, and I mean, that's kind of what it was. It was like just yeah. give me what I need to know. Whereas I think right. education is supposed to be. You're, you're yeah. the, you, you have a bachelor's in education. I think it's supposed to be, um, a good in and of itself, which is that's what right. it is for me now. Now right. that I've learned the value of education and reading, but uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely didn't get that at the university. Yeah, and that's uh, one big thing that we're trying to do at Southwestern, especially in our our college program, is we have a humanities program, mm -hmm. and people always ask, like, well, what do I do with a humanities program? And my sort of cliche answer is always anything yeah, you want to a, go get a master's degree in whatever because, you want. <laughs> yeah, you you will be you will be trained to think well. Yeah. trained to sort of, you know, uh, work, work your way through life. And again, you'll be formed in a certain way. So that was the challenge JP gave. And I really took that to heart to say, I just need to slow down. I just need to, yeah. I, I'm not done after this one year, uh, you know, apologetics degree. So I re-upped there at, at Biola and this time in their seminary program for their philosophy program, uh, sort of noticing that everybody that I, loved and you know wanted to be like in some ways um to have their degrees in philosophy yeah and so i didn't i had never had a single philosophy class not not genuine philosophy right. class uh until i walked into jp moreland's uh graduate level metaphysics class and just thought what have i done dude that's exact <laughs> i okay so uh, uh we talked before i don't know if you remember or not but i'm an ma phil uh, student at Southern Evangelical Seminary, right, and right. I, had, I had to take a break uh, the last semester. But before that, I had my first semester and walked into a metaphysics and was I didn't walk into because it it's online, but yeah, signed, yeah, up, yeah. signed up for that metaphysics Virtually. class and and thought, what do you mean being qua being? I don't even know what that yeah, means. Yeah. What are you talking yeah. about? Like it was like a you know you don't know what you don't know, and you're right. speaking a language I don't even understand. Of course, I'm yeah. caught up now, and I, and I'm. Think I know some things, right? Right. Well, <laughs> yeah, I that's think crazy. I know too that metaphysics isn't my uh, particular and best area, but I prefer epistemology myself. But anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. So that was I was swimming for at least a semester, uh, barely, barely swimming, and uh, but you know it's like, man, I just fell in love, and um, and I really, in a way, just told the Lord that I would go as far as He would open doors. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would be fine to just finish this seminary degree and, you know, go do something with it. Um, but if he wanted to open more academic doors, then I would walk through them. So I ended up uh, and, and a lot of guys actually Biola are sort of Ph.D. bound. Um, you know, they'll apply to a bunch of different programs and things. I, I applied to five. My wife said, go anywhere you want to go uh, for a Ph.D. if you want to do it. But we need to be near family. So it was sort of like that really, you know, restricted uh, yeah. the possibility. So I applied to five programs and, yeah, got into University of Iowa with a, sort of the red carpet uh, and got in with funding and, and just had a wonderful experience working with, with the folks there. Um, 
and I was a little nervous, uh, honestly, because all of my previous education had been Christian-based, uh, faith-based, uh, and then walking in there. But uh, honestly, I, there was it was either the experience that um, these brilliant professors, I could tell, hadn't really taken due care to really consider the philosophy of religion questions or the Christ, you know, sort of the religious questions, um, right? Or they they just sort of bought answers that I felt like were easily questionable. So where I kind of thought I would, kind of the doubts would come mm-hmm. raging back in, uh, didn't happen at all. In uh-huh. fact. Yeah, well, I guess uh, the apologetics and philosophy degree that you got at uh, yeah. Biola well prepared. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. Awesome. And that's what I say. Like, when we do, in fact, find answers to some of those struggles, some of those doubts, um, it really has this powerful effect yeah. for the next time yeah, it gives as you much a, as it does yeah. for that time. Mm-hmm. It gives you a certain confidence that, mm, I bet you I can figure out what's wrong with this. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's like I, it's got the feel of it that's familiar. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I say with my kids, I want them to experience some of that so that when they, you know, and I'm not there right. next time around, they've, they've got the, uh, sort of familiarity to be able to, uh, press in and ask and answer, you know, uh, investigate and mm-hmm. hopefully answer the question. Yeah. Well, we're going to fast forward and get to the book, but first I want to, okay. uh, I want to say, uh, thanks to our patron supporters that make all this possible. And if you're listening and you want to become a patron supporter, you can do so by following the Patreon link in the description below and uh, become a supporter for as little as a dollar a month and that'll get you access to the live episodes that I do over there that are patron only and I can uh, address Q&A and stuff like that in the live episodes but also if you want to watch the bonus segment five more minutes with Dr. Travis Dickinson you can follow the same link and become a supporter at the next level uh, back to you Dr. Dickinson you, we're going to fast forward a little bit on your biography to move things yeah. along uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you make it through Iowa you get the PhD in uh, epistemology or in philosophy and then uh, you uh, I don't know if you did any other teaching jobs or not but you find your way to Southwestern That's and right. uh, you eventually write a book uh, tell, uh, the title of the book is Stand Firm Apologetics and the um, is it the beauty of the gospel? Did I get that the right? Brilliance. The brilliance the of the brilliance gospel. Of the sorry, gospel. yes. Yeah. Apologetics and the brilliance of the gospel. I do have a copy of it. I don't have it in front. <laughs> I don't have it in front of me, so I was trying to pull from memory. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, brilliance of the gospel, and uh, I'll leave a link in the description. Uh, you should definitely get that. Uh, but Dr. Dickinson, to kind of tell us where the idea from the book came from, yeah. and, and what unique contribution does it make to apologetics? Yeah, good. Um, Thank you, you know, for the opportunity to talk about it. Yeah, so uh, it's a special book for us. So um, uh, it really came from a few colleagues uh, and me sitting down talking about. We were actually talking about some conference uh, things that we were putting together and uh, wanting to do things somewhat differently. So uh, it's it's not uh, in every way the the standard fare. Uh, a lot of all right. What I should say is there's a lot of. Um, apologetics books it's kind of the same material just sort of rehearsed in maybe slightly different ways or, sure. or repackaged and there's definitely stuff that you know we're, we're not reinventing the wheel by any stretch but I think what we wanted to be our unique uh, contribution is that um, we're bringing one a sort of intellectual or academic uh, you know background uh, to some of these issues which I think is important I, I that's kind of where I see myself playing a role in various events that I get to, you know, be a part of is, um, there's a lot of these great guys. You mentioned Jim Wallace. I love Jim Wallace. He's, he's kind of a mentor figure to me. I think he's a mentor figure to a lot of us. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and there's, but there's, there's kind of a a number of guys like that, that, and I think they are absolutely crucial in playing an important role, but there's not as many academics that are, uh, getting to play, you know, sort of being invited to the bigger uh, apologetics events. There's some, yeah. but uh, JP, you know, he's he's uh, I love him. He's slowing down some. And Bill Craig, he's you know, these guys. We we need younger uh, generation of scholars who are going to defend without uh, you know uh, apology, if you will. Uh, yeah. The <laughs> the truth of Christianity. Um, and, and anyway, that's where we kind of see our role. So I think that's part of what the book is trying to do. We're also uh, we love this this idea of the brilliance of the gospel. Yeah, I wanted to touch on that. So whenever I think yeah. of apologetics, I think of the truth of the gospel. Right. I'm guessing the word brilliance was intentional. Why don't you tell us about that? 
so it's intentional to have two meanings. Uh, one is to be smart. Like when we say somebody is brilliant, you know, mm-hmm. we might say mean that they are smart. Uh, so it's meant to be intellectual and that sort of thing. But it's also uh, tries to talk about the beauty of the gospel as well. That might be why you, uh, you know, thought of the subtitle that way. Probably. So we're trying to say it's also we also think the gospel is just the kind of thing that we can't not look at. Mm-hmm. It's um, it's dazzling in various ways. And uh, again, I think we think it's well grounded intellectually, but it's also this sort of beautiful, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, story in a way of, um, you know, redemption. I mean, it's the it's the best story. It's the biggest story. And and it's beautiful in that respect. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the beauty of it then for just a second. Uh, Why do you say that the gospel is beautiful? Yeah. So um, I think there's probably no bigger story than that uh, God himself, right, uh, uh, is sacrificed on a cross um, for, in our place uh, for us, mm-hmm. out, out of love for us, right? So, I mean, when you think about the bigness and, and the greatness and, and the grandness of um is grandness a word? I don't know. But anyway, you get now. what I mean. Yeah. Uh, right? It, it's this sort of beautiful image that even if it's false, like it's still beautiful. Like even right. if it's false, it, you know, in terms of its truth, it still is incredibly attractive. Right. Um, and we're drawn to it. I also think of Jesus in a similar way. Like I, I, I would want to be a Christ follower even if he's a mythical figure. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, if it's not true, then it's a problem for me. I don't genuinely, I think, become a follower of Christ, but I would want to be. Yeah. It's like he's, to me, I'm kind of already in the game just because of the beauty of Christ's message yeah. and the way he loved and, and treated people. Um, and philosophically, like I, I think that's a really important piece to mention is that Jesus provided a kind of philosophical way of life that's also beautiful. Yeah. It, it's a way of human flourishing. Um, and so all of that, to me, makes the Christian message, let's call that the gospel, brilliant and beautiful. Yeah, I think uh, um, I'm probably quoting somebody, but like the gospel speaks to the whole man, uh, so to speak. Yeah. And, right. uh, you know, I think that this beauty part, if what we're getting at is that, um, it needs to be um, attractive, uh, like you said. Uh, I think this is almost maybe even more important than the truth of it whenever it comes to, you know, engaging with skeptics or engaging with somebody that's, yeah. uh, you know, got doubts and stuff, at least in my experience. Like, I, w- I would love to say that it all just comes down to the facts, right. ma'am, but right. it just doesn't. It just doesn't. Right. And, and uh, I think the biggest question, I honestly think the biggest question people are asking is, is Christianity good or, right. you know what I mean? So I think this is, yeah. um, I think it's a, a big contribution to uh, focus in on this. Um, I think it's chapter two deals w- more with epistemology. Is that correct? That's right. Did you write that chapter? I guess I, I, yeah. So we, we did divvy it up and we were sort of had our own chapters that we were the principal author of, but we all collaborated. And so I call of all, all of them mine, but, um, yeah, but yeah, that, that's the one I sort of, uh, uh, initiated. Okay, cool. Well, you, there's some words that are defined in there, and I kind of wanted to go through them just for the the audience, and then we'll camp okay. out, we'll camp out on one of them and kind of discuss for a little bit. But the first word is truth. What do what is 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 truth relative? Yeah. Is it uh, absolute or objective? Uh, what is truth? It's totally relative. No, yeah, okay. exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, I so I think truth is actually quite simple uh, in some ways. I think that we and so do my kids grasp the nature and, and uh, concept of truth. So uh, when, say, my son, uh, this is, I'm making the story up, just so you know, but uh, he comes to me and there's a little chocolate on his face and some crumbs on his uh, shirt. And I say, did you eat the cookie? And he says, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, is that true? Like he knows what I'm saying yeah. at, a, at a really young age, actually. I think that's kind of interesting. Now, if I say to him, okay, well, what's the nature of truth? You know, yeah. <laughs> he's got no idea. Um, he couldn't articulate the uh, a theory of truth. But that's okay. We, we grasp these concepts mm-hmm. from a really young age. And I think it, what 
I think what he grasps is actually a kind of correspondence yeah. theory of truth. Again, he's not going to be able to articulate it. I'm not going to be able to say correspondence theory, and he's going to you know be able to weigh in on that or anything. But um, you know, maybe soon. But we'll see. He's seven. <laughs> uh, but uh, right, I think that a correspondence theory. So what is the correspondence theory? It was, yeah. It's the sort of basic of it is that. Uh, so whatever we say, think, or assert uh, is true insofar as it corresponds to uh, the way reality is. So what I always think is important to say is that, right, uh, with with truth, we've got two things with the relation that holds between the two. So we've got the way reality is. We've got certain facts uh, on one hand. And then we've got the way in which we make sense of reality on the other. We've got uh, the thoughts in our heads, uh, you know, so to speak, the the things that we assert, our sentences, you know, however we sort of think of it. Uh, we des- we s- describe the world, we represent the world in our beliefs and so on. And when those stand in the appropriate relationship, let's call that the correspondence relationship, then those things are true and they're false otherwise. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So that yeah. that makes for a kind of objective. Yeah, you know, it makes truth. for objective so, truth. So so whenever somebody says, "Well, what's true for you may not be true for me," right? Uh, how do you how do you respond to something like that? I say I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, pretty much because. Yeah. Um, I think what somebody's trying to say actually is coming from a good place when they say that. Like, uh, what they're wanting to say is we all have different experiences. Yeah. We all have different ways of seeing the world, and I'm kind of the first person to agree with that kind of thing. I, I'm, I, I agree that we all have different, you know, sort of approaches to the world, and that's sure. um, that's just the way it is. Yeah, that some are some are true and some are false. <laughs> right, but that's it, it doesn't <laughs> therefore make your belief correspond to the way that reality is yeah. uh, any more than mine does, uh, especially if they're contradictory or contrary in some way. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and so along the same lines, uh, we start talking about um, the word faith, which I think is, yeah. is a big topic for discussion in uh, yeah. uh, atheist Christians' uh, uh, conversations today, um, especially with the uh, guy that showed up at your Christian book club the other day, Mr. Aaron Ra. Yeah. Uh, right. But uh, so how, how do you define faith and, and kind of where you get that definition from? Yeah. Um, so I uh, – I, I, recently was on the uh, unbelievable podcast with yeah. Justin Brierley and had the opportunity a very civil very wonderful discussion uh with uh Brian Blaze uh there and anyway um very much in contrast to the more, more recent one that I think we're going to talk about in a minute but um uh what I like to say is first of all I think one of the mistakes that we make when we talk about faith is we try to make it a kind of epistemology yeah. or we try to understand it with epistemic terms. So here's what I mean by that. It sounds more intimidating than it is. Uh, epistemic terms would be things like no, believe, uh, evidence, justified, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think, I think it's actually a big mistake to think of faith as a way of knowing the world. Sure. What I think faith is, is a way of sort of acting in the world. Yeah. Um, and what I like to point out is that we've got Hebrews 11, 1, which we can talk about. Um, but I think what we have more predominantly through Scripture are these sort of metaphors or pictures of faith where our relationship with God is sort of pictured as a, uh, you know, bride to groom yeah. relationship. Often it's also pictured as a parent child relationship. Yeah. And I think those are two beautiful pictures of faith because you very much when you when you get married, uh, right? I mean, you, you literally cannot have a healthy marriage unless there is very healthy trust yeah. had between the spouses. And I don't think usually it's it's any kind of irrational trust. Mm hmm. It's actually, you know, what do we, I mean, hopefully, again, in a healthy marriage, um, there's certainly ways in which we can trust a, a spouse in an unhealthy way. Yeah. But hopefully what we've done in the dating process and getting engaged, et cetera, et cetera, is gotten to know that person and gotten to a place where you can, uh, uh, you know, have a conviction of things hoped for and assurance of things unseen 
such that when you say I do and you sort of join your lives together, you will move forward. You don't necessarily know how it's going to go for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So there's there's definitely uh, a sense in which it's unseen what's going to happen. But I hope you've got really, really good reasons to entrust yourself to uh, your new spouse. Yeah. So I think you're, you're exactly right, and I think um... – uh, the way you phrase it is very good. So somebody might, you know, if I uh, ask somebody, how do you know that God exists? And they say, well, I just take it on faith. Yeah. Well, they just use the term in an epistemic way, like you're saying. Right. As if faith is a way in which we come to know something. Right. Um, when it's clearly not, it is a relational term. Uh, right. Like you are talking about, more like a, a, a two spouses uh, have, yeah. have faith in each other. It's really trust. Yeah. Um, and it's a it's really a certain kind of trust i like to say uh I, for a sort of easy way to say it is i always say that faith is ventured trust because yeah. it's one thing to say uh and i always like to use the example also of an airplane for some reason yeah, um, perfect. because it's kind of the craziest one of the craziest things we do as humans is get on airplanes yeah <laughs> right yeah it's kind of nuts we go in and we strap in and we're actually like flying through the yeah, air it certainly it's, feels it's that way crazy. to me i hate it <laughs> right. Uh, and if it, well, what's funny is I hate it. I mean, I, 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 my experience with it is that I'm so used to it that I ha- and I have so much trust in the airplane that a lot of times I'll fall asleep. Yeah. Right. So it's like not me. I'm I can't even I can't even get up to go to the restroom on an airplane. Is that right? OK. Just, just my knees well, shaking. <laughs> yeah. OK. Uh, so you, you're not a person of faith, I guess. No, I'm kidding, but, um, <laughs> of great faith. But no. Uh, right. It's almost like I'm so caught. But then if you ask me, how is all this working? Yeah. I, I, I'm going to have to say, I really don't know a lot about how an airplane works. Um, and that's not a bad picture of the Christian faith in some ways. Right. Right. Where we have, especially at the beginning, like we've sort of like entered in, we've entrusted ourselves to Christ. Yeah. We certainly don't have it all figured out. Yeah. We probably only have a few questions answered at that point. Uh huh. And yet we get on board and on this wild ride yep. that is Christian faith. Yep. Um, it's a lot like uh, to me. I just like that metaphor. Well, I think it's a good. I think it's a good analogy for a couple of reasons. Uh, the foremost would be because it explains perfectly the distinction between this uh, trust that has come through no- by by way of knowledge versus this trust that yeah. has come by way of experience. You don't. Yeah. You don't put your the air the pilot may put his trust in the airplane because he knows how it works, or right. or, the, or the engineer um, right. might do so. You're putting your trust in the airplane because you've experienced a you know I don't know how many flights, but say a hundred yeah. flights. You know it ain't going. Well, you know the likelihood of it crashing is not very that good. That it's trustworthy. Like yeah. you can trust your. So trust yourself with the Christian. It. That's not familiar as you or I about apologetics or philosophy. I don't think they're right. un- unjustified at all in believing right. because they have uh, that internal witness um, through um, experiencing the Holy Spirit, experiencing yeah. salvation. Yeah. And I think you know that's that's a great point because the faith ends up being very similar. Like we both get on the airplane. Yeah, exactly. One does it in a more confident perhaps, uh, or maybe the difference of you and I would be, I would get on more confidently than you or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. <laughs> uh, right. And, but especially like somebody that knows you could investigate how it all works. Yeah. And presumably you would be even more comfortable getting on board. But you might with the airplane illustration. I don't know. You may actually <laughs> cause you may cause you to doubt some if yeah, you start investigating be, that. Be. So one question that comes up uh, on this topic of, uh, of faith is, is always doubt. So it, yeah. I think doubt, is it kind of the opposite of faith or kind of how should we think of doubt? No. So that's what, again, if I can keep beating this illustration uh, to death, uh, I could be sitting on the airplane doubting, that I should be flying through the air at six miles off the planet, yeah. uh, you know, at what, you know, 500 miles per hour or whatever it is, I could, I could, I could be struggling with why does this actually work? And I think that's a pretty apt description of Christians that are going through uh, a time of doubt, because if you're doubting, you still believe, presumably, you still sort of like are acting, you know, on in faith and in trust, mm-hmm. uh, entrusting yourself to Christ. Um, 
right? You haven't walked away yet if you're doubting. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think not only is that consistent, I think that should be uh, thought of as pretty normal. Mm-hmm. Like I think it should just be part of our experience, especially as we're growing in our faith and things, that we would be asking the deep and difficult questions such that we would say, you know, I'm kind of struggling with this right now. I kind of, I'm kind of feeling a pull in both ways. I'm feeling that tension, which is all I think doubt really is, is where we, we feel a pull from, you know, uh, some objection or what, or whatever. Um, and that should be a very normal experience. And then as we lean into those and we investigate, uh, hopefully we find good enough answers that, in a way, satisfies those doubts. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's definitely important to, you know, be honest with yourself and not try to ignore them. I know for the longest time, and I, I don't know why because I don't have anybody to blame for this. Uh, nobody ever told me you're not allowed to have doubts. Yeah. Um, well, people do say that. They do say that. They do yeah. definitely They definitely do say that. I was just saying uh, um, I'm not going to say publicly that somebody did uh, that to oh, me I because they, cause okay. they, cause they didn't. I had a pastor who would either try to answer the question or say, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know, and maybe this resource can help you. Yeah. And so I'm thankful for that. Um, right. But yeah, a lot of people tell us not to. So let's actually uh, one last question on this before we uh, kind of switch gears. Is it should we feel guilty for doubting, and should is it sinful to doubt? Yeah. So I do think uh, uh, you know for a long time I, I used to say no, it's not sinful to doubt. Of course not. It's you know it's the kind of thing where we get little choice um, oftentimes. Uh, but I do think there's a way in which we could doubt in a kind of uh, way that I think is at least kind of a, a toxic form of doubt yeah. um, or what I call toxic doubt. And that's where you um, really, in fact, do have good reasons, uh, right? You, you've, you've pushed in, you, you've investigated, but you, you still sort of waffle in your confidence. Yeah. And there's, there's something that's going on. And I think sometimes it's social pressures I think that we want to fit in. Uh, we're not. I think we. I and all of us do to some degree. We. We. And, and especially, actually, as academics, there's a big pressure uh, to sort of believe in certain ways and and defend certain views and and not others. And I think that sometimes we give in to those temptations and things. But generally speaking, the kid or the person uh, that's just asking the deep and difficult questions and as a result of that they're kind of struggling with it yeah uh no i don't think that's sin at all in fact again i think that's just a normal step towards just dis- in in discipleship and a yeah. normal step towards growing to to a kind of mature faith yeah I, I think this is a very important distinction um and uh i think some twitter heroes came after you one time for making the <laughs> distinction oh, uh, yeah, yeah. but uh yeah i mean because w- whenever you and i are talking about yeah doubt's not simple of course it's not because it's basically what we mean is asking questions isn't simple yeah um but i mean you're not going to ask a question if you don't think it's a valid question and to admit yeah. that it's a valid question is to admit that you have a level of uncertainty yeah. Which is, you know, basically what we're, we're talking about there. Uh, but speaking of people coming after Dr. Dickinson, we're going to switch gears here <laughs> and uh, talk about a recent experience that he had that was just yeah. um, the best. And that was an experience he had at the Atheist Christian Book Club, which uh, I propose is in or suppose is in the uh, DFW area. Um, yeah, I'm not. Right. I'm not familiar with the organization, but uh, uh, tell us kind of uh, how you got invited on there and uh, who it yeah. was. Who it was you got invited on to discuss with? Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's a great group, honestly, and I I don't have any uh, anything ill to say towards them for sure. In fact, I, I love those guys, uh, the folks that are part of the regular book club, and all they are is they're a book club that they uh, group of folks that. Um, Made comprised of atheists and theists, and uh, mostly Christians, uh, as far as the theists go. But they will uh, read a book together. I mean, on their own, you know. And then they'll come together once a month, and typically they'll get the author either in on Skype or you know something to that effect. Uh, or if they're local, they'll bring them in to to be with them and, and just give them questions and hard questions, like it, it, great interaction. Um, so my connection with them was with the Stand Firm book. Uh, they, they invited me to come in, and they, they read it. So they read um, 
it's usually not the whole thing, but they read certain key chapters and, and things like that. And so I came in and uh, answered questions, and I was like, man, that was that was like a I was on the hot seat for sure. Um, you know, a couple guys that were a little on the hostile side, but sweet about it, nice about it. Um, but it was nothing compared to the next <laughs> time, which just happened this past okay, Friday. Okay, so this you, you were just describing a different time. A different Because I'm sitting time, here yeah. going, hold on a second, I watched yeah, the video, yeah. you're right, live. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> that was just me by myself, so it was just me. Uh, they they have two uh, moderators, one's Christian, one's atheist, and they they're the two founders of the group. So like, like I said, the the group's wonderful. It's a, it's an incredible setup, and they've had some great authors on again both atheist and Christian. They try to alternate it. Uh, I can't remember if it was before me. I think it was the month before me. They had John Loftus, who's a, a fairly prominent atheist, and he's written a bunch of books. Uh, so he was on the week before. And so they said, hey, why don't we get both of you uh, together? They're going to fly John out, and uh, he and I will sit up there, and they'll ask the audience will ask us questions, and then we'll ask each other some questions. Um, and so that's that's how we uh, did you know that came together. Did you know this character John Loftus uh, before you agreed? I yeah, I, I knew of him. Um, I hadn't re- read a lot of what he'd written or anything like that. I kind of knew his story. Um, to some degree, because he was he was a uh, Christian, uh, as as a lot of these guys actually. Interestingly, actually, it, what's interesting in the group, you've got uh, almost all the Christians were once atheists, and almost all the atheists were once Christians. Yeah. So they've kind of all just uh, switched sides, and now we have a book club together. Um, but I didn't know a lot about him. But I just I think his claim, one of his claim to fame is that he he was a student in the classroom of William Lane Craig. Yeah. Well, okay, give us a uh, a brief description of the process of that night and kind of how the events unfolded. Yeah, so, I mean, it, again, I, I love those guys there. Uh, but, yeah, it got a little hostile, uh, I guess maybe a lot hostile. Um, yeah. And it was, you know, me being asked questions and then um, – various voices jumping in very loudly yeah we had a we had um, a surprise things. we had a surprise celebrity in the audience <laughs> i guess it was a surprise i i guess so too i don't know uh but yeah Aaron raw was was uh, a guy that was there uh who again i don't know a lot about him either but he's got a i think a pretty huge uh youtube following yes he does so yeah, yeah so yeah and, and he was very loud and um Unfortunately, I think there was they had sort of had a meet up for uh, drinks beforehand. I think there was a few too many drinks uh, for some of them, and it it got to be where the uh, it, it had sometimes that doesn't have an impact, and sometimes it does. This was an instance where it certainly did. Yeah. Um, and the outbursts were loud and, yeah. and of of the drunken sort. Yeah. Well, Dr. Dickinson's a very nice guy, and he represents the seminary. So let me explain what really happened. No, I'm just kidding. Basically, two <laughs> drunk atheists show up and yell at Dr. Dickinson for I don't know how long, an hour and a half, and um, clearly do not care about the. I'm sorry, they don't. They clearly do not care about the pursuit of truth, about uh, ra- uh, cordial or rational dialogue whatsoever. They obviously wanted to hear their voices, and uh, yeah. therefore they just yelled about random things. Okay, yeah. I'm not saying your questions are invalid, but definitely random. Dr. Dickinson, I, I didn't make it very far through it. At the yeah. at the beginning, is asked what counts as evidence, and all of a sudden he's being yelled at, prove the virgin birth. So yeah. I mean, it's like okay, that's a fair question to ask. How do we believe that? Um, you know you know in the virgin birth but where did you pull that out of where did that yeah. come from and it was very clear that at least one of them was wasted not just a little drinking yeah. but was yeah. drunk as heck and uh, that's <laughs> that's that's a pity because i l- and you too you're a philosophy professor i'm a philosophy student we or at least I do this because I just love the engagement. Like I had yeah. Tom jump on the other day. You said you were on uh, Justin Brierley's show with somebody else. I love, I mean, I love engaging with you and other apologists and teachers and philosophers, but I'm, I really love dialoguing with somebody that just doesn't di- agree with me. Right. And, uh, there's just something about that meshing together and working together towards the truth. Yeah. And that cannot happen 
in the kind of situation <laughs> that you yeah. found is when you've got somebody that just wants to appear smart in somebody else's eyes and just wants to hear their own voice. Well, and shout down the opposition. Yeah, I think yeah, 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 yeah. It, it made it not, I mean, to say it wasn't a productive dialogue assumes that it was a dialogue and it, it wasn't, it wasn't, yeah, that's being too generous in some ways. It wasn't, it wasn't really a dialogue if uh, what you were getting largely on the other side. Now, again, I, you know, there were some guys there that were asking some thoughtful questions and I appreciated those guys very, very much. Um, and wish, unfortunately, that dialogue actually got cut short by the outbursts. Yes, of course. Like if you're so if you're an audience member and you're shouting over and over and over from the audience, you're yeah. pa you're pathetic and you need to yeah. leave. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> if I was there, I would have told him to leave. If yeah. I if, if I wouldn't have just left myself, I said, well, this is just. Pathetic. Yeah. I don't know. So I don't know how you made. It. I don't know how you made it. Yeah. I would have just well, left or been like, can yeah. you leave because this is annoying? I think I, I, and you know, I don't know, but I think that I have the sense that they think this is going really well for them. Yeah, yeah. They do. <laughs> I'm, I'm owning this, Christian. Yeah, tell me and, about the virgin birth. <laughs> and I can't imagine now looking back, they think that went really well for this them. So the, it's sort of like, I think I was able to just hang in there knowing that they're making a fool of themselves. Yeah, and so. I'm definitely going to cop that video, and we will be doing a response video on the Help Me Believe okay. channel because I'm okay. not letting that one go. That is absolutely <laughs> – it's got – because it's got – because I don't care to own them or whatever they thought they were doing right. to you because it's got to stop. Yeah. I mean it's got to stop. Um, th it reminded me of political dialogue in this country right now, which is yeah. absurd and why I mostly stick with philosophy and apologetics because I just yeah. – I just can't even watch what's going on the news and the TV anymore. Um, yeah. And Tom Jump and I, it's, it's so crazy because Tom Jump came on and we talked about this exact thing and how thankful we were that him and I could do this sort of thing. And uh, they're, these gentlemen that you're talking with are very well known, which is the problem, because yeah. they, they really do actually influence people. Yeah, that's right. And, and so they're that's influencing right. other people to behave and um, have – try to I can't even call it dialogue but try to yeah try to do the same thing it's just absolutely absurd I, I don't right, right. At, at one point where you did you did it never cross your mind to just get up and leave uh it didn't actually um and I think again for the folks that were there um I, it, it was it's been interesting because I've had a few of them reach out to me some of the you know atheists of the group in fact and just say I'm sorry for that. Uh, we appreciated you. And I think my, that's my biggest takeaway is, um, right. I mean, going back to what we talked about a bit earlier, that, uh, what is sometimes so powerful in the lives of people is not actually the intellectual sort of highly rational arguments and especially not the formal arguments and things, but it's these, you know, sort of aesthetic qualities that yeah. one sees in a Christian's life or sees in the gospel, sees in the life of Jesus and so on. And so I uh, I feel like the response that I got from some of the atheist yeah. uh, you know, friends that was, are there, was worth sticking uh, it out for. Yeah, it was almost like I, I think there, there was an impact. Yeah, um, I think you're right. Whether or not they realize it or not. And so, man. In some ways, if those if that's the more powerful stuff, anyways, uh, it's probably worth sticking it out. Yeah, in a situation. I think you're like right. That. I think you're right. Despite everything, the, despite the rant I just went on, I think you're definitely right. <laughs> and I actually know that, that you're right from experience. Um, just like the conversation I had with Tom Jump uh, recently to keep, yeah. to keep bringing him in into the uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, dialogue here. But uh, so on his channel, he debates, uh, and we didn't really debate. We just kind of had a conversation. I really interviewed him about his views. And then um, afterwards, there was no trashing the Christian that was on Tom right. Jump's channel. I mean, maybe there was some, but I, it was mostly like, "Wow, this was really cool. This was really nice." Right. Um, and so, and he's I, and he's like a raging atheist. Like he's he's a he's fully. Oh, he's definitely uh, very like, strongly atheist. You know, not not even I, I don't mean raging in a bad sense, but he's right. like fully. Yeah. An atheist. He's an uh, anti theist. And, yeah. Yeah. Like, like it's about as strong as you possibly be, as far as I'm aware of him. Yeah. And, uh, and yet he's able to, uh, sit down with you and, and yeah, have you a can, civil yeah, conversation yeah. and reasonable conversation. Yeah. And, you know, the fact that he was reasonable and, uh, polite the same way that I was to him probably made yeah. an impact with 
you know, my audience as well, saying yeah. it works both ways. Right. And this is really the only environment in which, um, you know, we're going to, um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? We're get to the truth and get to yeah. uh, a better future, even from, right, a moral, right. from a moral standpoint. Right. Uh, so what advice, uh, one last question for uh, Dr. Uh, Travis Dickinson again. Uh, if you're listening and you want to watch the bonus segment to five more minutes with Dr. Dickinson, you can follow the Patreon link below and become a supporter. But one uh, more question before we get to the bonus segment. What advice would you give to uh, aspiring apologists or just people who want to start dialoguing uh, with skeptics and atheists? Yeah. Um, I just have to do one. Is that I'm right? You can do as many as you want. You can do as many as you want. Uh, no, I think that um, I guess what what comes to mind is that um, there's something to be said for digging in deep and in technical ways. Yeah. So uh, we can read the sort of popular level apologetics books, and again, I'm such a fan and so much in favor of of needing the popular level apologetics books. But I think there's also a real need to um, dig deeper and and to be trained, um, right? In, in that in those technical sort of ways. Again, it's hard work. It's not always fun work. Um, it's going to be slow and and kind of not not uh, you know all hit hit all of us in the same sort of way. But man, I I think there's just such a power that comes when you like can can think well on that level and then be able to speak to my seven year old and and speak you know apologetics to on, on on that popular level um right so like we need to have that deep grounding uh and that that well that we draw from uh which is our training and so i, I think that would be something that i would say not everybody's gonna be able to do it right but as as much as you're able to get trained uh, in a highly ac rigorous academic setting uh, is is well worth every penny. I agree. Well, thanks so much for joining me. Again, if you guys uh, listening want to watch the bonus segment, you can follow the Patreon link below and become a supporter. Dr. Dickinson, thanks so much uh, for agreeing to do this and taking the time out of your evening uh, to let me ask you some questions. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, it was a year in the making, but it was well worth it. <laughs> <laughs> If you enjoyed the episode, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, leave us a review. If you want to watch the bonus segment, Five More Minutes with Dr. Travis Dickinson, follow the Patreon link below and become a supporter of the show. And for just a dollar a month, you can get uh, early episodes as well as the weekly live Q&A episodes for patrons only. Thanks so much for joining us, guys, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.